sorry, I'm going to have to, can everybody hear at the back? So we usually have microphones, but today I think we're just going to have to shout. Um, I'm Perry Hunter, undisputed queen in the north. <laughs> um, my my uh, wife said she'd uh, give me 50p if I introduced myself that way. <laughs> um, I've got quite a few books under my belt by now, I think eight. Um, most of them featuring lovely northern lasses stomping up on the moors, getting in scraps and eating biscuits. In terms of this panel, which is going to be about challenging the lesbic norms, so what you would expect when you pick up a lesbic book, and what necessarily, or what we're not writing, what we do write, what we don't write, why we write what we write. Um, I wrote a series of three crime novels set in Peak District, which initially perplexed by a lot of readers who were expecting their crime to be, well, more romancy. Somewhat ironically, the leading ladies, Meg and Sana from that series, now regularly crop up whenever the issue of favourite lesbic couples is mentioned, so go figure out. We have Iliandra Young, uh, the bewildered and confused in her own words. She's no idea why she's here, but since she is, she plans to stick around as long as possible. Illy writes more about vampires than she probably should, it's a thing, and secretly plots world domination by way of mature cheddars, savoury crackers, and the unleashing of her adorable and video game obsessed kids upon the unsuspecting. She has a book too about vampires, but it also has werewolves, demons, and guns, so for her it's a step away from the norm. Careful though, ask her too much and you will get your ear chewed off in a nice way. <laughs> Next to her we have Michelle Grubb. Michelle is a proud resident of the very posh East Riding of Yorkshire, Yorkshire, <laughs> where by day she marvels at the University of Hull students' ability to stay alive despite immeasurable stupidity. <laughs> by night she's even less enthralling with the odd bit of DIY and her obsession with spinning on a bike, that is, in her lounge in Lycra. <laughs> she promises. <laughs> Why are you wearing it? Why indeed? <laughs> She says she promises to write another book as soon as she's finished plotting it. And next to her is Charlotte Green, who's come all the way from the US of A. She describes herself as the nerdy and learned. Yeah. Charlotte came by airplane and train to be here today from Texas. Her recent and upcoming novels include Ghosts and Spooks, with some lesbian romance thrown in to lighten the mood. She will entertain all questions about her books, her craft, her gorgeous wife, and their cat. So feel free to bend her ear later. Right, so first things first. What actually are the norms? Does any if if we were to say what, what is a normal lesbic book, would anybody sort of like know what they would expect in terms of that? And we're talking sort of like I'm talking lesbic here as in uh, indie and small press, not sort of mainstream, because the term only seems to apply to those, not like Sarah Waters. And, um, well, I'm sorry, Walters, really. <laughs> <laughs> so I've put down here that the three R's of lesbic. Romance, romance, romance. You'll all recognise the formula if you're a regular reader. It goes a little, well, a lot like this. We've got girl meets girl, the eyes across a crowded room, pulses quick and pounds go down. <laughs> they're instantly smitten, they probably clash a bit, then they admit that they're smitten, they have a few mind-blowing orgasms, then they have a tiff, then they get back together in time for the happy ever after. Phew. <laughs> Which usually involves even better sellers. So, it works. It sells by the bucket load. Readers want it. So why the hell would anybody write anything different? <laughs> Is basically what we're here to discuss. So, if there's a standard formula that readers want to read, why do we why do we take away from that? You wrote about vampires. <laughs> um, largely because I don't know the formula. <laughs> That is, uh, that is another question. Did you actually, before you wrote your book, did you even did you even know that there was a standard lesbian farm? No, no, I didn't. Um, and um, I did get picked up in the editing process towards the end, where I was told I might have cheated my way to the happy ending because I didn't follow that formula. And I thought, oh, never mind. <laughs> it's supposed to be about vampires anyway. So um, I kind of what, what I did know. Not, not so much the whole formula, but what I did know was that there should should be a happy ending or a happy for now ending. And I was perfectly happy to have that, you know, after all that vampires were dealt with. Um, but I didn't do the work beforehand following that formula to get to the happy ending. So I now know the formula, I didn't know the formula, and that's why I didn't follow it to begin with. But now that I know it, I probably still won't 
Mm. I was going to say, do you, would you feel pressured to fit into it? No, because no, um, for me, I, well, that's a romance formula, isn't it? And I don't really write romance because um, it frightens me. And there's not enough guns in it, and there's not enough vampires in it. Um, it is a thing, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I think because there is a formula, it's quite nice to step away from it and not follow it on purpose rather than by accident. Because if you do it on purpose, then you can play about with that formula and do funny things with it. Um, and that, from a writing standpoint, is actually a lot more fun than just following the track. Michelle, you had a couple of books that you could kind of shove into the romance. Absolutely. Your first yeah. two, weren't they? Yeah. Did you write them accidentally as kind of more formulaic? Were you aware that there was a formula? No. Or did they just, they were just there as... Yeah. Well, actually, as a child, I read Mills and Boone. Not a child child, but... <laughs> <laughs> I was sure I was about 12. So I did know there was a formula. I didn't, obviously, realise it was a formula. You don't read Mills and Boone and think, oh, there's a formula. I mean, it, it is literally a formula. Radcliffe will have, there is a formula. There is a percentage of what you should be doing in these books and when. It's, and it's, it's, it's mathematical. It's, it's the mathematical. same almost for, it, well, it is the same regardless of whether you're writing lesbian mm. or straight romance, the formula. Absolutely. Is the so I, I did know that that's how a romance went. I didn't realise, though, that that's how every romance went. I thought it was, maybe I was just picking the ones that went like that. So um, I think it's, when there is a formula, it is easier to write. It's just a little bit repetitive as an author to continue to write it. Um, so it is, it's okay. I think if that's what's, you know, everyone loves a good romance. And it's, isn't it the world's largest selling genre or something? So it's, it's perfectly okay. I think that there gets to a point though when your brain as an author just sends itself off into little tangents. So you come up with something else that doesn't fit that, necessarily that formula. And I think that's where I headed, um, but still managed to slot it in, so I didn't get too much grief. Is this with the fifth gospel? <laughs> yeah. so I didn't get too much grief from. How would you editors. describe genre-wise? How would you describe the fifth gospel? No, I did a bit of everything in it. I, don't I, don't know. Know. I mentioned no. If I was a Catholic, I probably wouldn't describe it particularly well at all. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of Da Vinci Code as mystery. It was a little bit of everything, and then with a bit of romance. With some religion. Yeah. 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 Hate mail. You get loads of hate mail if you write about Catholic. <laughs> Not Catholic people, I didn't mean that. Uh, the religion. The religion. Yeah. Inshallah. Um, so I absolutely started by using the formula, like very aware. Were you a lesbian reader beforehand? Or no. Did, were you just I mean a little bit. Aware aware with uh, uh, George Beers and um, mm -hmm. Radcliffe quite a bit, but um, I set out to do a lesbian version of Fifty Shades of Grey. That was my, <laughs> my first book. I was like, I'm going to write a lesbian version of this and it won't, you know, it's going to actually have BDSM, and it's going to actually... Is that um, Palette for Love? That's Palette for Love, yeah. yeah. Um, and the, and the follow-up, Canvas for Love. Um, but, uh, as Michelle mentioned, um, I kept writing romance. My first four books were romance, and uh, it's it's not what I read. Um, and, and I wanted to write horror, I wanted to write mystery, um, because that's, that's what I read for fun. So, um, that was my me kind of getting off. I was like, well, I'm just going to do this one ghost novel um, and see. And it was it was such a different writing experience. Um, I think I was forcing myself into the formula, and I don't need to do that anymore, basically. How did your readers react to your switch? Did they, uh, were they bothered by it? it? Um, I've gotten a lot of reviews, like, she finally feels like she is happy to do Right, so I think they felt it too. They, they felt like <laughs> they were like, Don't yeah, yeah. I think they felt that that almost like a lifting um, that I was doing what I should have been doing probably from the beginning. On that kind of on that kind of theme, is it difficult to balance an urge to write for your own pleasure, to write what you want to write against the desire to sell well? Because I mean, we'll all know from experience that our less romantic books are the ones that perhaps don't hit the sales that are more typical kind of romance work? Yes, um, absolutely. I think I, I really, I think that was why I was afraid to do it to begin with. Um, but it just felt, it felt to me like I, I, I either had to change or I needed to stop writing. I think there's a, 
I mean, I got lucky, I think, in that I, I kind of started out, when I wrote Snowbound, I didn't really know what the formula was, but I accidentally wrote to it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that kind of got me a, a bit of a readership, and then I did another couple of books that kind of stick, almost stuck to the, the, to the plan, and then went to crime, and was lucky enough to take readers with me. And I think that's probably the way around that Bolster Ropes would advise you, if they were to advise you. <laughs> would say write something typical and then kind of edge away with your readers that you've got from your typical kind of uh, it's story for them. <laughs> but then you'll just <laughs> come storming in with vampires and werewolves and why the hell not? So how important <laughs> it, is it to create variety within lesbic? I mean, it's difficult because lesbic is seen as a genre in itself by some readers. And it, it, it's just, instead of having a genre within it, like your crime and your sci-fi, your futuristic, your, um, your historical, they will just see lesbic as that genre. So they can't distinguish then the, the, the kind of um, the, the sub-genres really, which we would all recognise from mainstream. So you will get you know, quite a lot of snippiness if you write a book that doesn't have the two plus two equals happy ever after. Um, but how important is it for, for authors to actually create variety? There, there are readers out there for that variety. And do you hear from readers a lot? Do you get feedback saying, thank goodness you've written something different? Mm -hmm. Or do you get feedback from readers saying, I hated this because it wasn't what I wanted it to be? I think first and foremost, you have to write for yourself. Yes. I think you, you reach a certain age, which I've reached, where you don't actually care what everyone else wants to read. <laughs> so you end up writing what you want to write. And then once you've got that story, it then I suppose you do have elements of trying to think about, well, what, you know, if I kill everyone off at the end, that really is going to be a bit shit and no one's going to want to read that. That's actually not that pleasant. But you get to a point, I think, where you write for yourself because it is such a long and lonely process doing it. If you start writing, well, it's fine to, to start writing in that formula, it gets you going and all of that thing, but I think you do have to branch out. And if your readers come with you, they come with you. I generally don't write. I don't care really. People like that. that's not right. It's not that I don't care. I don't think when I write a new book, will I take a reader with me? That's not my thought process at all. Um, if they want to, it's the same as when I choose a book in the library or a bookshop. I don't necessarily choose something that I've read another, the same author write. I, I choose it based on what it is. Um, and if I have read an author in the past and I pick up their next book and I happen to think I'd enjoy it, then I'll read it. Actually, I don't go to a bookshop, I go to the library. <laughs> At least writing, because it's very posh. And um, <laughs> so it's not, I don't think I write for anyone in particular other than myself, <laughs> selfishly. But you're with those characters and you're with that book for a long time, though. You have to like me. It takes me years to write a book. If I wasn't happy, if I wasn't happy to write you what I'm writing. Out on it. Stone tablet. <laughs> I write long hand. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, I mean, I'm a paramedic, so I, you know, I, I work in this, I write in between shifts. My brain just work for probably 50% of the year, but I'm still with those characters a long time. How long does it take you to learn? Sorry, Kiri, I can't hear you in the back. Sorry, love you. Sorry. I was going to say, it takes, it takes us a long time to write a book, so if you're not enjoying what you're writing, it's, it's a hell of a long time to be stuck with characters and a plot and a genre that, you, that you're not. Uh, that you're not liking, basically. How long does it take you to write? Uh, it varies, actually, because um, I've started changing how I write, so I plot a lot first, which mm -hmm. I never used to do. Um, so the actual writing part is really quick. The plotting part can take months. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when I'm discovering the characters and learning who they are. And if I don't like them, I'm not going to write the book. Because mm -hmm. it, it's like you said, it's, it's so lonely. It's a very it's a very interesting thing that we're doing, so if we're trapped by ourselves, trapped, um, with these characters, you, you need to you need to enjoy being with them, otherwise it will show in what you write. It will show that you don't want to be there. Um, and readers do notice, they do notice. So, um, <laughs> I'm, a bit, I'm a noob, um, so I have that one book. Um, I'm not thinking necessarily about will people follow me, I mean, I hope they do because it's not the first one, there's more to come, you know? Um, but I'm far more interested in building on the relationship I've created with Danica and Rain, and if I can do that and enjoy what I'm writing about these two characters, then I can't possibly be the only one. And so, 
for me, I feel if I write it in a genuine way and I have a true connection with the characters that I'm writing, other people will feel that and they'll come with me. Hopefully. On the, uh, uh, on the sort of on the uh, theme of that, what's the best feedback you've ever had from someone who's enjoyed your work just for you know for what it is? Did it make all the hard work worthwhile? One of my best friend's mum sent me an email after reading the fifth gospel, and um, which was horrendously embarrassing because I'm like read the sex scene. <laughs> and I always tell people I know that my mum wrote the sex scene, so I didn't tell her that. Um, <laughs> but it was nice feedback from someone, I, I think it's lovely to get feedback from strangers, but from someone who you know, who's bothered to read your book, who's of a different generation, um, and who gives, you know, just bothers to, to do that, I think that was quite special for me. Yeah, and I feel like some of the feedback I've gotten where they really got what I was doing. Um, and it, you know, I, I think it's, I absolutely want to bring my readers with me. And, um, but one of the things that I've been noticing is that I'm getting new readers who were looking for exactly what I'm making now. So my old readers are saying, oh, you're doing something different, but I like this. And I can tell that you like this. And then my new readers are like, I've been looking for a ghost story um, just like this. And it reminds me of, you know, my, some of my favorites. So um, when I see that they see that, it makes it makes absolutely makes it worth it. Yeah. Have you found yourself because you're not necessarily writing typical stuff? Have you found yourself having to market in a different way, looking outside of the the, the sort of like the lesbian field for readers, uh, new blogs or different review sites? Have you tried sort of different avenues, or have you just kind of sat within? Then the ball strokes kind of spin and left it as it is. Have you, has anybody ever tried? I'm going to be labelled as lazy. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> um, no. To that. I mean, it is difficult and it can be soul destroying. When I wrote uh, No Good Reason, I thought this was probably my best, most crossover with mainstream that I was ever going to do. So I went to um, Crime Writers of America and I tried to like our local bookshops and and you know the crime writers didn't recognise Bolstrokes as a publisher, so that was kind of out. And the, the, the local bookshop didn't want to stock it, and it is really difficult. And then along came Cara Hunter, who is a mainstream crime writer who has been Richard and Judy listed and all sorts. And there's loads of people who bought my books accidentally thinking that I was her. <laughs> so <laughs> I was first. She she almost stole my name. It's absolutely not me riding on her coattails. But I have seen the sales of the Dark Peak series go over here, and Radcliffe must wonder what the hell's going on, basically, because they, they are selling their charting probably higher than they were when they were first released. Um, I do get the odd snarky kind of bit of feedback from, I have one from some straight guy who obviously picked it up accidentally and was appalled that anybody would write lesbian characters just doing their jobs working as doctors and, and, and police officers, and it was as if, and he's obviously never worked in the NHS because my god there are so many queer people. <laughs> oh, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot move in, on our ambulance station without Without, without tripping over a gay chap or a bisexual or what have you. So yeah, that was that was quite fun. That was accidentally reaching the mainstream. <laughs> but not everybody can kind of ride on the coattails of a rich dude listed on I suppose. I just got lucky. Um, right, Bolstros, I remember when we were told to write a blurb that you were supposed to hint at a romance no matter what, even if there wasn't really one in there. Do you feel pressured? Did you feel any pressure sort of submitting something a bit different to, to kind of fit it into that mould even if it didn't fit into that mould and if so how did you deal with it? Yeah, I was absolutely asked, you know, what is the romance? After I submitted the, the book proposal, what is the romance? So um, before you even got past proposal yeah, stage? Yeah, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what did you say? I said that there was one. Did you lie? There is, but the, the book is probably 80% ghost story, 20% romance. Um, and so to me, it didn't feel fair to romance readers to market it as a romance mm -hmm. when, yes, it has a romance, but it's not, it's not the term. Deep, deep yeah. plot kind yeah. of, uh, yeah, definitely not deep plot. What was the question again? <laughs> Do you, did you feel pressurized by um, sort of publisher? No, I put the pressure on myself actually. 
I didn't, and uh, I didn't feel pressurised by them, them from by bold strokes at all. So I think I made a choice to make my life easier <laughs> by doing it that way. Um, and I, I'm not convinced I wouldn't necessarily do it again, but probably to a lesser extent, or not so much a, a conscious choice to actually do that. So. I think the fifth gospel could have been written without any romance at all, really. Um, but it was my choice to put it in. So. Um, didn't feel pressured exactly because with both ways that there was an element of it there. Tiny clock. Um, <laughs> but I was very conscious of the fact that it wasn't a romance story. Um, it just wasn't. That's not what I wanted to write. That's not what came out when I finished writing. So um, when I was working on the blurb for that, I've written this you know, lovely 150 word piece and gone, oh, <laughs> there's no hint in here at all. Back to the own board. And of course, I know. And um, I've just finished kind of putting the finishing touches on the blurb for the second one. And Having been through the experience once and understood what the expectations are, I'm sitting there again thinking... Just makes you a little bit twitchy, doesn't it? It does a little bit, because I don't want to... I don't want to disappoint anybody, but I don't want to disappoint myself. Um, and I don't want to mislead anybody either, because it's not yeah. fair. Um, but I also do want to highlight that these two characters who were hinting at it in the first one have problems in the second one which are because they're in a budding relationship but that's not what the story is it's kind of it's not even deep though it's like Z1 <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I don't know but they're all for let's fit diversification if they're you know if they want sci-fi crime young adult fantasy dystopian what can they do to try and sort of encourage us is it reviews is it feedback is it spreading the word is it everything? I think it's all of that just, yeah absolutely all of that because as a reader I got to a certain stage when I first discovered lesbian I was oh, romance lesbian romance I was just enthralled by it but it has a certain shelf life as a reader you get to a stage where you want something different or something more or something else and I found it quite difficult, even at the time, to even find an English author. I think I found your book, which I don't remember the name, but I'm sure I did. And I'm sure you loved it. I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was quite refreshing, having an English lesbian author. But uh, if nobody knows and nobody is aware that people want to hear or read those sorts of different stories, then they just may not happen. So it needs people do need to say and be quite vocal about it. You know. There's nothing wrong with writing a review and saying, you know, this was a lovely romance, the story was brilliant, or this was a great story, but, you know, it would have been just as good without the romance. It's not, it's not an insult to hear that, and it can help steer people in, in different directions, which they may have not felt uh, enough courage to go down before. I think there's always that, the review that is the counterpoint to kind of anger from Arkansas. We're, we're all after those reviews, the ones that, you know, the, the love the book for what it is, for what it was always meant to be, not for what it isn't, and um, you know, not for what that person, that angry person, thinks that it should have been, just because they're stuck by kind of conventions. Um, do we have any questions? We have a few minutes left, and if not, I've got some questions for you guys. You talked about formulas, and life isn't a formula, is it? You talk about having to follow a certain method. <coughs> in order to write a love story. But if you're writing a love story, life isn't a formula. Life is very ups and downs. So I just want to see why, when writing a love story, you have to follow this happy, sad, um, argument happy type. Again. Yeah, <laughs> when life isn't <laughs> like that, you know. Um, What's wrong with your life? But no, but for you know, I, I just struggle to find, struggle to 
see that, you know, that as authors you, you are obliged to follow this set pattern when, you know, when we all know that life isn't like that and that it has to be, you know, yes, have a little bit of the happy sad bits in, but it just seems really sad that you have to follow such a set way of writing. It's less of, a, less of an obligation than a kind of advisory almost because it's, that formula yeah. works and it's kind of what people who are reading within the genre, especially within lesbian fiction, kind of expect. I mean, there are loads of authors kicking back against it. There is loads of variety coming out of publishers, coming out of the indies. So it's nice to see. I mean, we've got you know all sorts of writers here. Um, Jane Fletcher with fantasy and sci-fi and historical fiction. Um, it's just that you kind of you write in it knowing that you will probably take a few a few hits for it, um, either in sales or in feedback, reviews and whatnot, which is why the positive kind of feedback is, is so important. Yeah, it's a little like, I mean, I got the impression that the formula is, is like Starbucks or McDonald's. Like, we know people want this because people keep buying it. Yeah. Yeah. But Starbucks could come out with, you know, a new drink and some other people will buy that one, right? Or, I, I just get the impression like any business, they, they know what will sell and they're just a little bit reluctant to, to, to vary. I mean, you will often see authors, um, you know, somebody like D. Jackson Lee who writes, she's got a really set kind of pattern to her book. She'll do sort of deep south, horses are often involved. And then she wrote her Dragon Horse trilogy. Um, and probably took a hit on it. She obviously wanted to, to write it and probably had amazing fun with it and probably needed that switch away from what she usually did, but she's gone back to writing what she's you know successful and known for. And it's just that that's kind of the cycle, the cycle that, that occurs really, I think. Um, you just have to, sometimes you have to step away from the formula just for your own kind of sanity. Um, but the ones I think who stick to it are probably the ones that are the most consistently successful in terms of sales. Do you think it has a lot to do with the financial aspect of what sells and what doesn't? Unfortunately, and um, there's, there's also the escapism involved in reading a book, if that makes sense. Um, people I've spoken to, like in my friendship circle, if they read romance, they read it because they know what they're getting, they know what emotional experience they will have, and that's what they want. Um, and if they don't get that when they pick up a romance book, then it's disappointment or anger, but it's, <laughs> there's not much in between um, in this little circle of friends. And I think it's not so much an obligation, but an understanding that for many folk who read romance, that's what they're looking for, um, and catering to that. It's it's very much an example of writing for your audience, mm -hmm. I think. Unless, of course, you like writing that kind of thing, then you can write it for yourself too, but I think it's much more of a writing to meet the expectations of the people who look for romance. Um, I mean, I don't even know how many years back this was, but I did look into Mills and Boone just to see what they wanted, and. It was a page, quite literally, of by chapter one this has happened, by chapter two this has happened. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, no, it's it's a really, really set on, on Mills and But I thought about it a bit more and I just thought actually every single book follows that formula and people buy it and people love it so they know what they're doing. It's a massive mm. skill to write that. It's, you know, it takes, it takes it's a lot of skill to actually, to actually write <laughs> that. I can't do it. Yeah. I, um, yeah. To actually write that clinically and tick all those boxes is, yeah. is massive skill. Mm. Yeah. I was just wondering how much you know about your readers and audience and how you know what you know about them. Where do you get that information from? Sorry, Kira, can you repeat the question? It was how much do we know about our audience and our readers, um, how well do we know them and where do we get the information from? Mm -hmm. I have a mailing list. Um, so people can sign up to my mailing list and I'll send them emails not as often as I should, <laughs> and then people will respond if they want to. Um, and the list is separated out into two sections, so people who just want the boring 
this is what I'm doing email and those people who want to know more like do you want samples of what I'm doing do you want to know what events I'm going to do you want to know about my indie stuff um, and those people tend to be the ones that I have a talking relationship with so they'll find me on Twitter or they'll poke my Facebook things like that um, that's how I talk to my readership oh, podcast as well um, so they can actually listen to me chatter about nonsense for a while and <laughs> then respond on YouTube um, but it doesn't tend to be through things like email away from my mailing list or comments because I, I should probably look at those but I don't <laughs> actually <laughs> I'm not as in depth as that. Quite quiet. Yeah. Um, I like to assume that everyone's lovely, <laughs> and more so than me, because probably I'm not that lovely. But I'm sure I like to assume that everyone is reading things because they're interested, because they're broadening whatever they want in their life, and I just naively assume that everyone's a little bit like me, actually. <laughs> but nicer. <laughs> um, Twitter a little bit, and then, I mean, just on the financial side, the sales records, right, also tell you a little bit about what people want, right, <laughs> actually, truthfully, but definitely Twitter's my main fan in the base, I guess. I think Facebook for a lot of a lot of lesbian kind of um, readers will be on Facebook groups like the lesbian review group and just interaction on there. I mean, I get quite a few sort of like private messages or um, emails. You can get emails from the blog, uh, from the website, the Bolshoi's website itself. I've had a couple of messages from there recently, which I didn't know was a thing. Um, but mainly with me, it's just chatting online. And you get to know your readers that way. Um, but um, I have a little. A Facebook group as well for the kind of more committed readers, shall we say, where we can just talk about stuff that I wouldn't necessarily put on uh, my main kind of profile page. But yeah, I think the, the longer you stay as a lesbian fiction author, the more you get to know and get a good idea of what your demographic is and who you're appealing to, who other authors are appealing to, um, who you might want to appeal to, uh, who you're not necessarily going to appeal to and will probably never, you know, never kind of entertain them. Um, but yeah, the longer you're kind of in the field, the more idea you certainly get of, of who is going to be picking up your books and who isn't. Um, any more from while we Go on. I was wondering, what, what makes a book qualify as less fic? Is it just about having lesbian characters or is it about having to write a specific formulation? That's a really good question. The question was, romance. what qualifies a yeah. book as lesbian? Lesbian romance. <laughs> 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 that, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of where we're landing in this discussion, isn't it? Um, well, you need a lesbian. Yes. <laughs> definitely. You definitely need a lesbian. Hopefully, too. <laughs> 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 oh. You know, anywhere within three. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, that seems to be it, doesn't it? Yeah. An um, orgy of lesbians. I mean, I, I think the standard is a lesbian romance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, see, that's, that's the problem that we kind of, well, not a problem, it's the happy little thing that we bang our heads against, is that people who will say lesbian will be meaning, yeah, the romance, the, the formula that I described at the start, and they do, some people have difficulty kind of accepting that within that umbrella term, there are other genres. But does that, does that mean you then find yourself in, in a bubble effect? Because heterosexuals don't think it's hectic. No, no yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, are we kind of like absolutely <laughs> marginalising ourselves? That's a good one, though. I like it. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing I will say about my, my most recent is that I am getting some crossover readership. Unlike my lesbian romance that's read almost entirely by lesbians, <laughs> uh, I'm getting some pet readers, right? Um, which is different. And I'm getting accidental ones. <laughs> <laughs> I get my best friend's mum, so I'm not <laughs> <laughs> It is difficult to break out of that bubble. I think it's, I don't know whether bolsters are just kind of happy with, with it just being close to lesbians. And it's, 
and I'm that kind of uh, limited audience. Um, but it is difficult to break out of it. It's difficult to pop out and you know pop that bubble and step out into the mainstream. Um, and like I say, every time I've tried it, it has been like banging my head against a brick wall. So you just kind of don't. Really, I'm, I'm very happy with my lesbian readership. Um, I don't feel like I need to be branching out or adapting or sacrificing my lesbian characters or dialing down on the queer or whatever to try and appeal to a mainstream audience. I'm not interested. Not interested in. Um, but if they're coming on board anyway and you know and reading the books for what they are, then that's absolutely fine by me. Well. So more power to the Go on. Um, bearing that in mind, where do you think bisexual characters? fall in with that? Do they kind of come into the lesbian pick or is that a whole probably smaller bubble by itself? I try and include them, absolutely. So my, my ghost novel has a bisexual character. So. As an author I don't think there should be any boundaries to that at all. Mm, yeah. And you might find that there is with a reader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, possibly you would get a little bit of... Yeah, possibly you would get a bit of... Um, Negativity, shall we say? Yeah, yeah I just think there's a yeah, group of people that. I tend not to be specific. I don't, don't label. Um, but I know there's, you know, ace characters coming into books. There's. Done? Yeah? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought you were timing up. Um, yeah, the, the, I think in terms of what I know about what lesbian uh, lesbian authors are writing at the moment, they, they are broadening yes. the, the kind of spectrum in terms of sexualities. Um, I mean, the, the LGBTQ is getting a lot more letters after it, so hopefully they'll all be uh, represented and you know, enjoyed and um, in there for whatever you want to, to read and pick up. I think we had one more question back here, Jesse. There wasn't any question, it was one comment. Yeah. It's just like, um, I found that Mary Heller's kind of um, jumped the, the divide mm. in that it's almost, this, you can take Kate Daniels stories, it's almost incidental that Kate Daniels is gay, but she, um, the books are very much kind of focused and there's very little romance. And she seems to have jumped that, that divide between. Has she managed to jump that divide by closeting her character though? So yeah, that's the issue that I had with yeah, Murder Wall. I couldn't actually get through it because she was such a miserable, <laughs> miserable queer. Um, I don't want to read miserable quiz, I want to read characters who are happy being gay and are out and are just gay and it's not an issue. Yeah, no, no, she's, yeah, yeah that, that was my issue with Mary Hannah, but yeah, she is, she's a mainstream crime author basically, who, um, she's, she's had quite a lot in her Kate Daniels series now, hasn't she? Um, but yeah, I, I didn't, I struggled to get through the first it's true, one. Kate's not happy no, she's not. If, if you were after, you know, positive kind of queer representation, it's possibly not the book. Yeah. <laughs> She's not here, is she? No. <laughs> she wouldn't be. No. That's fine. Time. Right. Thank you very much for that. It was. Um... <laughs>